The only real hope and change you'll ever get is from God. It's going to come from the Lord or it's not going to come at all. It's going to come when you admit that you can't do it and that you've got to have His help. Romans 5.10 For if when we were enemies we were reconciled to God by the death of His Son, much more being reconciled we shall be saved by His life. Now before anybody has a conniption fit and you read that, Nevertheless, it's God's Word we just read, is it not? So in order to deal with this and understand it, we've got to rightly divide the Scriptures and look at it. Look at this verse in the verses leading up to it. The opening word in verse 1 is therefore. You see that? It's an indication that it naturally connects with something that's gone before. And it tells us that if we're going to understand these Scriptures here, uh, we're going to need to understand what happened before and that's why it's there turn back a few pages to Romans chapter 4 verse 20 through 24 we're told that God's way of in these verses of salvation of saving Abraham here Scott talking about his and counting him righteous is also God's way of saving us counting us righteous let's read that he staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God, and being fully persuaded that what he had promised he was able also to perform, and therefore it was imputed to him for righteousness. Now it was not written for his sake alone that it was imputed to him, but for us also, to whom it shall be imputed if we believe on him that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead. You see that? If we believe on Him that raised Jesus our Lord from the dead, Abraham looked forward in faith to the finished work of Christ. In John 8:56, Jesus said to the unbelieving Jews of His day, He said, Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day. And he saw it and was glad. And we look by faith to the finished work of Christ. We know this and we enjoy the same salvation that Abraham enjoyed. All through the first four chapters of Romans, the Apostle Paul has been building up the case against all of humanity, all of men. He brought the whole world into the courtroom in these chapters and he's proven from scripture testimony and from the evidence of the lives of men and women and how they live that there's what? None righteous, no, not one. What a solemn thing that is. How many righteous? None. No, not one. Not me, not you, no one. We know that Scripture tells us in Isaiah 64, 6, that in the sight of God we are all as an unclean thing. All our righteousness is but filthy rags. The Scripture also tells us in Romans 3, 11 and 12, there is none that understandeth, there is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way. They are all together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good. There it is. No, not one. Again. And so Paul concludes that terrible indictment of the human race with these words in chapter 3, verses 19 and 20. You can see that. Now we know that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law, and that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. For by the law, it's the knowledge of sin. And so as far as man's condition and his ability is concerned, it's utterly and absolutely hopeless. The message today, you hear all around you, is you've got all kinds of goodness within you. We hear that today. Oh my goodness, just live your best life now. You can do anything if you put your mind to it. Just pull yourself up by your bootstraps. That's what we're hearing. Keep on keeping on because you've got that divine spark within you. You've got an inner goodness to reach out and make the world a better place. Let's just join together, they tell you. Let's make it our goal to reach the heights of the global betterment of mankind. Good night. 
what a bunch of hogwash that is. But that's the message that's been pumped out for years. You know it. And the sad truth is, people are grabbing a hold of that nonsense and believing it. Let me just briefly share this with you, if I may. I believed on the Lord Jesus Christ and received Him as my Savior as a teen many years ago. Did I know everything all about who the Lord Jesus Christ was? No. I just knew that day when my heart was a pumping fast that He was calling for me to be saved, to believe, to receive Him by faith and trust. I did know that I was a sinner, that He died for me, that He was buried and He rose from the grave. I knew that much. All for me, and I believed Him and I received Him, and praise be to God, I have everlasting life since that time, and it hadn't been the same since. Did I understand all about sin? No. In other words, I knew I was a sinner. I needed Jesus. That fact I knew. Did I understand all about the blood atonement, the propitiation, and justification, the sanctification, all the redemption and repentance? No didn't understand all that, but I began to learn as the years went by and I began to grow in the grace and knowledge of God as I delved into His Word. Have I had times where I slipped and fell and messed up and sinned? Yes, but He was there to pick me up, restore my soul and fellowship with Him as I confessed my sin and all my mess ups to Him. I was blessed, thank God, to have Christian parents who were careful to train me up in the way that I ought to go. I loved and served the Lord all I could because I loved Him and I knew He loved me. But through the years, I talked with quite a few people while in college and grad school and who thought a lot different than I did, and who seemed to me, they seemed to be confused. And I was taking courses in school and learning like them all about different beliefs, philosophies, psychologies of religion, all of that and so on. And I'm telling you folks, it was a different gospel than what I knew to be true. I found myself reading less and less of my King James Bible and began reading other so-called translations and or let me just call them what they are, perversions of the Bible. And I found myself listening to some false messages from preachers who might have respected. Just, you know, they were changing there too. Listen more to musings of men trying to open myself up to becoming what I thought God wanted me to be. God wanted me to be something other than what I was headed for. Some men were saying that salvation wasn't by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. Some were saying they had a staunch proponents of Calvinism. Others Arminianism. Others were saying and teaching there had to be some kind of works of obedience to do in order to keep you saved and make sure. Listen, anyone, and I mean anyone, who begins to drink that Kool-Aid and drink that drink, fall into that trap that your salvation is kept by the things you do, are going to find themselves with a lack of assurance. And I mean a boatloads of no real joy or fellowship with the Lord. The fellowship with God that you once had will dry up like the Sahara Desert. Well, I knew something wasn't right with that. So I began to do my own study and delve into the Bible. And since that time in those early years, I mean, I've emailed and talked with a lot of people who are absolutely confused about the truth of the gospel that I knew and believed so many years ago. What's that gospel? 1 Corinthians 15, 1. Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, wherein ye stand, by which ye also are saved, as ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. For I delivered to you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried, and that He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. Is that not clear? Clears the bell. So what's causing all the confusion? It's because so many have been duped into believing that works needs to be added to salvation they receive. Folks, it was done and finished at the cross. That's why the Apostle Paul said, I'm determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Listen, so many have taken Satan's bait, hook, line, and sinker. You know that's true. Believing that the works we do are part of God's saving grace in our life. Nothing could be further from the truth. The devil's invented subtle ways, subtle ways, to get Bible-believing Christians to add works to salvation without even their even realizing it. And to do it in such a way that it sounds spiritual and good. Let me say this. If you genuinely placed your hope and faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, and you've been born again and saved by the blood of the Lamb, you're His forever. And you'll know it. You'll know it for me. When the devil began to sow seeds of doubt and confusion, I found myself far from the heart of God. But I thank God for this Bible. Why? Because the words of this, in this Bible had, were, had been implanted in my heart and soul years earlier. 
that I came to my senses and back in 1997 down on my face on a painted gray concrete floor of an old house I'd been remodeling. The conviction of the Lord grabbed a hold of my heart, came upon me, and I found myself confessing and repenting. Praise God he came to me. He drew me back to him again, and you know what? I mean, I came close. He drew nigh to me. And so many of the scriptures and promises of God that helped me during this time were right here in this book of Romans. Actually, they were all over this Bible, but one of them was right here. Look at Romans 3.21. The scripture says, but now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all and upon them that believe, for there is no difference. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. And as I read the scriptures, the joy of the Lord, flooded my soul once again and I was reminded how the Lord Jesus had been my advocate all along. He took all my doing away from me. All along with the trap and the subtle lies of the devil. The Lord took me back to my first love and I mean when I first believed and I saw how my Lord Jesus himself was set forth as wisdom, righteousness, sanctification and redemption. Amen. It's about the Lord Jesus Christ. Everything is in him. It's all about him. For him and nothing else. I would hope so much that we can all say that. But the sad truth is that's not the way it is. Many are still going about trying to establish their own righteousness. Who've got the idea that the way to get themselves fit for the presence of God is by doing their very best to please Him and living a holy and righteous life. Now don't get me wrong or turn me off here. I'm not saying as a born again believer that in the Lord Jesus that living our life in Christ shouldn't be pleasing and acceptable to the Lord. I'm not saying that. That serving Him isn't important. No, no, no. That's not what I'm saying. God's Word bears out the truth of how we're to live as believers because we love Him and what He's done for us. We're to live holy, righteous, godly lives that are acceptable to Him and serve Him with joy and gratitude in our hearts. Yes, but not in order to be safe. What I'm saying is it's your best and my best is too poor for him. It'll never do. There's no way you can live the new life in Christ that he gave you, but in and through him. Paul understood it. I'm crucified with Christ. Galatians 2.20 Nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Romans 3.20 says, By the deeds of the law there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. If we could only see the matchless grace of God. Recognizing our lost, ruined, pitiful condition, he sent his only begotten son to this world to die for us, to bear our sins in his own body on the tree. Praise God! The Old Testament tells us it is coming in Romans 4.25. Look there. Look at Romans 4.25. He was delivered for our offenses and was raised again for our justification. What does that tell us? It tells me that my sins took the Lord Jesus Christ to the cross. And on that cross, he settled for every single one of them. All past, present, future. He settled the sin question to God's satisfaction. And now God's raised him from the dead. And in token of his per perfect satisfaction and the work that his blessed son has done, he sets him forth as prince and savior. The one, the only one to the father. He stands, he shuts every man up to him. There's none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Salvation is in a person. How many times have we heard it? Right here from this pulpit. It's in a person, the Lord Jesus Christ. And when you have him, you have salvation. He that hath the Son hath life. He that hath not the Son of God hath not life. You remember way back in Egypt when the land was stricken with famine and the people were hungry and distressed and they came to Pharaoh. They were hungry, stressed. Pharaoh said, go to Joseph. By miraculous circumstance and intervention of God, Joseph had become the custodian of all the corn and the food in Egypt. Anybody who would find relief had to go through Joseph. So let me say you today, if you go to God and you cry out to him, oh God, let me know that my sins are put away and forgiven. He'll do it. His word tells us it's so and God doesn't lie. He says, go to Jesus. Put your trust and faith in him. There's life in a look. Amelia Hull had it right when she wrote the words of her song in 1832. There's life for a look at the crucified one. There's life 
at this moment for thee, then look, sinner, look unto him and be saved, unto him that was nailed to the tree. The Old Testament message in Isaiah 45, 22 says, Look unto me and be ye saved, for I am God and there is none else. We know that God's been revealed in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. God says, Look unto me, be ye saved, all the ends of the earth. Are you worn out, tired, heavy laden? Look to Jesus, look and live, casting all your cares on him, for he careth for you. Someone said in an email, I've come a long way, hoping to find Jesus, my personal Savior, but I hadn't found him yet. I say that's good because you're trying to find him, bless you. Scripture says, seek the Lord while he may be found, call upon him, call upon him while he is near. But you know what? It's God who does the finding. God does the finding. He does the drawing. He's seeking for you. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Jesus said plainly in John 6, 44, No man can come to me except the Father which hath sent me draw him, and I will raise him up at the last day. You remember that little boy who was asked by somebody, Sonny, have you found Jesus? He looked up startled. He said, Why, please, sir, I didn't know he was lost. But I was, and he found me. And yet still, so many people are like the man trudging up and down that road, carrying a heavy sack of grain on his back, as it happened this humbly, strong, kindly gentleman, comes up, offering to help take the load off of him. The man says, okay. As they're traveling, the man who said he'd carry the sack of grain, notice the man behind, he's still trying to help him by lifting up that grain sack. When he asked why he was doing it, he says, oh, it's enough you'd offer to carry it for me, but I just thought you might need a little help. The sad truth is a lot of people everywhere weighted down all kinds of burdens, sins, mess-ups in this life, weighted down by shame, going the broad path to destruction. But the Lord Jesus Christ offers himself on that cross to carry all their sin and shame. Wants to take all of it on himself. You know what we say? We say, thank you very much. That's good. I'm so glad you did that for me. But just, I just think I need to do a little something to help you. I mean, to help you out. I can do it, Lord. I have to do something, right? No, that's wrong. That's called pride. The middle letter of that word is I. And nobody entered the kingdom of heaven that way. What they're really saying to God is the death of your son, the Lord Jesus Christ, and his sacrifice on the cross just wasn't enough. Listen to me, Jesus Christ is enough. He's enough. He's all you need for salvation. Stop and listen, God the Father, he's the one who draws the person to the Lord Jesus Christ. When Jesus said in John 6, 40, And this is the will of him that sent me, that everyone who seeth the Son and believeth on him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up the last day. There are folks that keep trying to figure things out. And what they think is the way of life, they don't know it. Jesus is life. He is the way. He is the truth. It means being honest with God, laying it all down, not trying to figure things out, opening your heart to the Word of God and letting Him speak to you. It means bowing your heart and head to say, Lord, Jesus, I'm a sinner. You died for me. You shed your blood for me. You bore all my sins on your own body on the cross. You did it all for me, all for me. We sing that song. I have nothing in myself. I can't save myself. And if I tried, I'd end up in hell. I trust you. I receive you. I, I take you, Lord Jesus, to be my Savior. That's all a person needs to do. And he'll take care of the rest. He never turns anybody away who trusts him like that. Never. Look with me again at Romans 4, 25. We're going to move on. Scripture says who? Jesus Christ. He's talking about Christ. Was delivered for our offenses and was raised again for our justification. And then the next verse, in verse 1, therefore. Now you see the connection? You see it? Being justified. In other words, being cleared of every charge because we put our trust in him. That means what it, that's what it means to be justified, to be acquitted and made free. Being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. All that's come between us and God has been cleared away. Why? How? Because Jesus Christ was made sin for us on Calvary. For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. And God raised him from the dead because of his perfect satisfaction with the work that his son had accomplished on that cross. Now the Lord Jesus Christ who died on that cross lives in glory at the right hand of the Father and he lives in us as believers by the power of the Holy Spirit. 
again and again in this Bible, we're given the blessed and wondrous truth that we don't worship a dead Christ. We're going to get to this. He's alive. I serve a risen Savior. I know that He's living whatever men may say. We begin at the cross. Yes, amen, and we go on. In other words, we're to be occupied with the Lord Jesus Christ who's gone up to glory, who died and He lives again. Look at verse 2. By whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand. Do you see that? What's Paul telling us? He's saying we begin at the cross. It was Christ who met us at our deepest need. We needed Him. We needed Christ. It was Christ who saved us. But now, listen, but now we stand in grace. It's not a question of beginning in the Spirit and continuing in the flesh. No, 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 no. What does Paul say in the rest of that verse? We rejoice in hope of the glory of God. See that? The result of God's gift of salvation is a changed heart and life. We see and hear things differently because Christ has come to live within us and the Holy Spirit of God has sealed us. And so Paul says we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. And to thus, to us, to those who are saved and justified, it's an absolute certainty. Turn over a few pages to Romans 8.30. The scripture says, Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called. And whom he called, he also justified. And whom he justified, he also glorified. Now I know we don't get all... That's not accomplished for all of us. It's just not. None of us do. We don't see that. But God's given us His Word. Amen? And we believe Him in what He said in His Word. We have this sure and certain hope. As Peter said, a more sure word of prophecy wherein to ye do well that ye take heed as the light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts. We've got the Word of God and the promises that are in this Word. We're told in Ephesians 2.4. But God, who is rich in mercy for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ. By grace ye are saved, and hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. And because of this, we're prepared to be able to go through the trials and the pains and heartaches of life with courage and even gladness, with a joyful countenance. And can it be tough sometimes? Yes. It's very hard. But again, we have this sure and certain hope. Even though at times there are things that distress and trouble our dear hearts. But we glory in tribulation. Paul said in verse 3, look there. Now just think of that. The next time that trials and difficulties come into your life, you glory in tribulation. The word tribulation, by the way, means a flail by which they thrashed out the wheat. God's word is saying we glory in being put into the threshing machine where the wheat is separated from the chaff. I can't tell you all the reasons why trials and troubles and afflictions and everything else comes into our lives and your life and mine. But I can tell you one reason that God's Word tells us in order that the wheat can be separated from the chaff. And so here we read in verse 3, We glory in tribulation also knowing what? Tribulation worketh patience. Do we need patience? Yes, I know I do. And patience experience. As we go on to learn what God can do for us and anyone else that who trusts Him. And when you trust Him in all things, He'll give you peace in the midst of it. Thou will keep Him in perfect peace. The scripture says in Isaiah, whose mind is stayed on thee. Jesus said, these things I've spoken to you, that in me you might have peace. In the world ye shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. And Paul continues there, verse 4 and 5 of Romans 5. And experience hope, and hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost which is given unto us. The Apostle Paul, by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, has been giving us the truth this morning. It's, it's a lot like the prayer he prayed for the Ephesian church over in Ephesians 3, 14. We don't have time to look at that, but look it up. Meditate, Ephesians 3, 14 through 21. Some of us have tried so long to love God and to love others, and we try to pump up love, and I'm afraid that some of the time we're just pumping from a dry well. Broken cisterns like Jeremiah talked about. Where do we see the infinite love of Christ shown? Love of God? We know it. It's clear we've been talking about it, and you know it to be. It's in the cross of Christ. 1 John 4.10, here it is love. That we love God, but the, not that we love God, 
but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sin. Propitiate the atonement. I mean, isn't that what broke our hearts when we were convicted of our sin and saw the deep love of God for us when he gave his only begotten son to die on that cross for us? And he drew us to himself and we were saved to be his forever. Hallelujah. And the Holy Spirit came to seal us, as Ephesians tells us, and when we put our trust in Jesus alone. Think about that. The Holy Spirit came to dwell within us. Hallelujah. He's in us, a well of water springing up to everlasting life. That's what Paul was saying in verse 5. The love of God, look at it, is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given to us. The Lord Jesus Christ is the spirit of love. He's the spirit of truth. Have you found it hard to love your brother and sister sometimes? Yeah, we're all honest. We all have some time or another. What do we do about it? We need to get to the presence of the risen Christ. Pray, ask God to say, Lord, give me such a realization of the Holy Spirit's indwelling in my life, His power and His presence, that all these petty things, all the junk, the, the, the animosity, the bitterness, the bickerness, the bad moods, the bad attitudes, and all that stuff just disappears. Help me, Lord. Call out to Him. He'll answer. He will. We can go on loving in spite of the, uh, the unpleasant things of others, can't we? You ask, well, how? How can I do it? How can I do it? When we're submitted to the Holy Spirit's control and we're listening to Him and we're not pushing Him away, you know that stirring in your heart, I do, when He's talking to you. And when the Holy Spirit can talk to us, when we're in the Word of God every day and we're spending time with Him, asking Him to conform us into His image, that we might be transformed by the renewing of our mind. What renews our mind? Hell of No. The Word of God. He'll do it. Listen, think of how undeserving we are. I deserve nothing but judgment and hell. Yet God loved me. He loves you. What could we ever do to earn His love and salvation? Absolutely nothing. Look at verse 6 and 7. When we were yet without strength, in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely a righteous man will one die. Yet peradventure for a good man, some would even dare to die. You probably heard how World War II veterans recount stories of GIs who fell on grenades to save their buddies. But you won't find a record of a GI falling on a grenade to save a Nazi. Let me just say this. It was in the days of Christmas. During First World War, the fight was very fierce. It was hard and harsh. The German soldier came up from his trench and tried to advance, but he was hit by gunfire and badly wounded. And as he tried to crawl back to safety, he got caught in the barbed wire. After his scream, he was screaming and he turned to moans and an American climbed out of his trench and he inched his way toward that injured man. And when the two opposing commanders saw what was going on, they ordered their troops to cease fire. And in the silence, the American comforted and freed that wounded German, carried him back to the waiting arms of his comrades. The guns remained silent the whole time until he returned back to his trench. Fireman, for example, he'll risk his life to rescue somebody from an arson-related fire. But the chance of that fireman offering to go to prison on behalf of the arsonist is practically zero. Parents may pay for the ransom for their child who was kidnapped, but they're highly unlikely to post bond for their child's kidnapper. Here's the point. It was not good men Christ died to save, but sinners. Not God's friends, but those who are enmity. God. And this is exactly what God did for us. Christ's birth brought God to man, and Christ's death brings man to God. For scarcely a righteous man will one die, yet peradventure for a good man some would even dare to die. Isn't that something? When we weren't righteous or good, what did God do? Well, look at verse 8. God commendeth his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Poor, pitiful, lost, guilty women like you and me and men won't leave them out. And yet Jesus gave himself for us. Look at verse 9. Much more then, being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. Amen. Just look at the certainty of that. What does the scripture say? For being now justified, what? By his blood. The precious blood of Jesus Christ. God's son. That's the answer for all of my sins. And God justifies fully and completely everybody who trusts in Jesus alone. And being justified by His blood, we don't have to dread the future, do we? No. Because the scripture says, we shall be saved from wrath 
through Him. In these days, listen, when we see everything falling apart, we have nothing to fear, not a thing. Because the one who died for us now lives to keep us. Isn't that wonderful? Yes, I say it is. So let's spend some time looking at this last verse. I know we've been some time getting to this verse. We read, For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of His Son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by His life. Now, let's think on that for a minute. Let these words sink in. Don't misunderstand them. They don't mean we're saved from the guilt of our sins by the beautiful life that Jesus lived here on this earth. No, not at all. That truly wonderful life of Jesus, perfect, holy, sinless, spotless, that wonderful life apart from His atoning death and the shedding of His precious blood at the cross wouldn't save you, me, or anybody else. He had to be who He was in order to do what He did. He had to be the holy, spotless, unblemished Lamb of God in order that He might die for all our sins on the cross. It's not Christ's life but His death that saves us. We hear so much today in churches all over that preach His his life, His life, His life. Our salvation comes through the shedding of His precious blood. And the Scriptures bear that out. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. So when it says we're saved by His life, it doesn't mean that we're saved by imitating the life of Jesus, by trying to follow Him. No. Let me say it very carefully, though. I have no doubt someone is going to call me a heretic for saying it. No one's ever got to heaven by following Jesus. You say, well, brother, wait a minute now. I thought that was the only way any of us could get there. Listen, if you could only get to heaven on the ground of your ability to follow Jesus, you'd never get there at all. What's whosoever doth not bear his cross and come after me cannot be to my disciples, some would say. Oh, doesn't the scripture say that? Yes, it does. Here we go. When you talk about following Jesus, what do you mean? People talk about following Jesus and seem to think that they can follow him from earth to heaven. Seem to think that that's the way to do it power of the flesh and my own strength I can get there. In other words, the attitude is we'll be okay. We'll be accepted if we just put our feet to the plow and walk in His footprints. No. That's not the way. Well, folks, I tell you that's all of works from beginning to end. Salvation is not of works. What do you mean by following Jesus? Following Him to heaven? No, that's not what the Bible means. The Bible means following Him out of heaven, down to this world of sin and misery, carry the gospel to every man, woman, and child on the face of this earth. It needs desperately to hear the good news of the Lord Jesus Christ at his death, burial, and resurrection. When Jesus says, follow me, it doesn't mean we're to follow him up to glory. No. The Bible says the Lord Jesus Christ is going to be coming to get every saved, born again to believer and take them to heaven and out of this wicked world at any moment. But until he does, it may mean for some of us to follow him to China or to India or to Haiti. It may mean to follow him to the slums to tell people of his love and grace. It may mean... Some to follow him down to Market Square, Knoxville, or follow him at work in our neighbors next door who needs to hear the gospel. Some it may be following him in the home to live there in such a way about people will see the wonderful joy in the realization the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, is who they need. Wherever you are, wherever you go. That's what it means by following Jesus. Listen, we're not saved by following him. We're saved by trusting him and believing on him and what he did for us on the cross of Calvary. And when we've trusted, when we've received Him, then we follow Him. To be saved by His life doesn't mean we're saved by our own self-efforts. You say, don't we read in 1 Peter that He left us an example that we should follow in His steps? Yes, but who is the us that He's speaking to? Who are the us? Peter's talking to. The us are those who've already been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. So what does it mean we're saved by His life? It means this, that the Lord Jesus Christ who died for us on the cross now lives. He lives to carry us through this life and then on to glory. He lives to maintain us, to sustain us, to give us all the grace and strength we need from day to day so that we can glorify Him in everything we say and do. He lives to make us exactly like Himself. That when He returns in power and glory, we're changing the twinkling of an eye at the last trump to take us home. Jesus said in John 14, Because I live, ye shall also. Think about it. We've been justified from all things, hallelujah. Now we can draw on His omnipotent power and as the living Christ gives us the needed strength to glorify Him as we walk by faith and not by sight. We are saved by His life. You remember John 17, that wonderful prayer of Jesus? 
He knelt while his disciples were looking on. He lifted up his eyes in heaven. Seven times he speaks of those that thou gavest me. They were so dear to him. The Lord Jesus Christ asked the Father in John 17, 17, Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. To be sanctified is to be set apart for Christ's own possession and for his use. The Lord Jesus said of himself in John 10, 36, Say ye not of him whom the Father has sanctified and sent to the world, thou blasphemest, because I said I am the Son of God. Our Lord Jesus Christ was set apart to come down in this world and accomplish the work of salvation. And that's exactly what he did. He was crucified, buried, rose from the grave, victorious, having conquered death in the grave. And he ascended to glory, took his place at the right hand of the Father. And there in glory, the Lord Jesus is representing us before God the Father. Paul says to us in Romans 8, 34, Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. Why? So that we might be sanctified, <laughs> separate from everything unclean and unholy in our lives entirely for His glory to live in this present evil world. And it's in this sense that we're saved by His life. He's making intercession for you right now. He's ever lived within you by the power of the Holy Spirit to give you and I everything we need. Jesus said, if I be lifted up from the earth, I'll draw all men unto me. Listen, when you're walking and living in the Holy Spirit, you'll find yourself loving Jesus more and more every day. I really don't know how much we understand the depths of this. I'm afraid some of us are condemned. Just, we'll just stop at the cross. Thank you, God, for the cross. Yes, we have to begin there. Yes, we preach Christ and Him crucified. There's no other way we can approach God but through the blood. But as we go on and grow in the grace and knowledge of God as believers, through His Word, we're to be occupied with the risen Christ at the right hand of God. He's not dead, but He's alive, folks. Now we want to be like Him. We want to be conformed to His image, to be transformed by the renewing of our mind. We want to be fat, faithful, available, and teachable. I like that. And use it of Him wherever we go, whatever we do, everything we say and do. In order for that to happen, the Lord Jesus Christ set Himself apart that our hearts would be fully taken up with Him and we're changed as we behold Him and strengthened by the Word of God. And so He would have us yield and surrender to Him, to His will, just like those who are alive from the dead. Are you alive? I'm alive from the dead. Yeah, without a doubt. All of us were, who are saved were once dead in our spirit. Were we not dead in our trespasses and sins? But now we've been made alive and raised to walk in newness of life. No longer dead. The risen life of the Lord Jesus who lives within us is to shine out in and through us. Read with me. I'm going to read 2 Corinthians 4.10 always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus Christ. That what? That the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body. For we which live always delivered unto death for Jesus' sake. Now look at this. That the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our mortal flesh. That, that through the indwelling power of the Holy Spirit sent from the Father, the living life of the risen Lord Jesus Christ is clearly seen in the life of you and me as believers. It's in this sense that we seek to bear witness of the one who died for us and now lives to keep us. That the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our mortal flesh. I don't know where you are today. Maybe you're weary, a burden, and you feeling like sometimes it's just too hard to make it one day to the next. Having a dry time. Maybe not sensing a sustaining presence and power of God in your life. And you're not sensing His strength, His grace flowing through you like you. I understand that because I've been there. I've been there. If we're honest, we've all been there. And maybe right now you're finding it hard to lay hold of what I've been sharing from God's Word. Romans 5.1, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. God gave us the one supreme, perfect, complete offering of our Lord Jesus Christ on the cross. And now God speak to, speaks to us of the constant intercession He's making for us by the risen, the risen Savior in glory. And we know Hebrews 7.25, it makes clear, wherefore He is able to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by seeing He ever liveth to make intercession for them. Did you hear that? He's concerned about everything that burdens you and me. He wants everything that wants to drag you down, He's concerned about. He's constantly interceding on your behalf and mine. He's bearing you up before God and wants you and I to live His life 
through you. He's got abundant stores of grace to minister you in your greatest need. He wants to meet you at the point of your deepest and greatest need, whatever that is. Remember that same blessed one, the Lord Jesus Christ, who died for you? Well, guess what? We've said it. We've been hitting on it. He lives for you. He's alive and for me. He lives. He lives. Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow way. Are you walking with him, talking to him? He lives to sustain you, to keep you, to give you blessed assurance, victory through the trials and the tests of life. We can't do a thing in our own power and strength. Can't do it, can't do it. You know this. It's only by His strength, His power, His grace, His mercy, His love, and His righteousness. Paul said, Christ in me, the hope of glory. Whoo! And then maybe if we grab a hold of that, if we can wrap our hearts around that depths of that wonderful truth, the hymn that the saint of God, Fanny Crosby, praise God, wrote, He hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock that shadows a dry, thirsty land. He hideth my life in the depths of His love and covers me there with His hand. He covers me there with His hand. And the Apostle Paul, who wrote by inspiration of the Scripture, the Holy Ghost, be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication. With thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God, and the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Amen.